Good evening. Welcome to a very special Melbourne Jewish Book Week event. I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which Melbourne Jewish Book Week is based, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And I also acknowledge and respect the traditional owners of lands across Australia, their elders, ancestors, cultures, and heritage. Tonight, very exciting. Uh, we are hosting the official relaunch of Jewish Quarterly, the prestigious literary journal featuring the voices of the world's leading Jewish and many non-Jewish writers and thinkers with essays and articles designed to dig, provoke and shine a light on issues that are important to the Jewish community. In fact, to all of us, to everybody. Um, before the main event, which of course is Simon Sharma in conversation with Jonathan Perlman, I, I just want to have a quick chat with the new publisher of Jewish Quarterly. Uh, he's one of the most important figures in Australian publishing uh, with a great stable of books and magazines and publications that I'm sure you're fully aware of. And now, of course, into international publishing. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Maury Schwartz. Good evening, Maury. Good evening, good evening. Nice to talk to you. So what on earth uh, possessed you to take over as, as publisher of Jewish Quarterly? Oh, well, you know, going international is a good idea, <laughs> uh, really. Uh, I, I, know, I knew one of the board members of Jewish Quarterly uh, based in London, and two or three years ago, he was saying that the internet had really hurt them. Uh, it, it became quite difficult to, for all publishers, really, of journals, particularly serious journals, uh, quality journals. And I got this idea, okay, let me try. So I, it's a great board of trustees and we had long conversations and we decided that I'd publish the thing uh, under license for 18 years. And so that's, um, that, that takes me to... Uh, that's been optimistic. One I would say that's been optimistic, Murray, is it? <laughs> that's right, that's right, very optimistic. Uh, <laughs> and we, we came to an agreement, our first issue is really issue 244. It's been going just almost 70 years. Um, so we've got, you know, a lot to live up to um, with, with what we do, but we've, we've changed the format, we've changed the way that it's done a bit, um, and we have a lot of, you know, I suppose, uh, experience with, with, with uh, publications such as Quarterly Essay and Australian Foreign Affairs, uh, where we, we, we realise that, you know, if you publish very seriously, there is a very large, serious audience for it. And, and, um, and, and what are your aims for the publication? Look, the, pub, the, the aims for the publication are to, well, in a way, we've, there are American, American Jewish journals, there are British Jewish journals, the Israeli Jewish journals, uh, and they're all very disparate, very separate. They talk to themselves, they're in their bubbles. And my idea is to publish a, a um, publication that covers all of them, that talks from Israel, it talks from America, from Britain, from here. Uh, so a, a truly universal Jewish publication, uh, at which, which tackles serious subjects uh, and, does, and does it with the best writers available in the world, both Jewish and non-Jewish, as you said. Um, the first issue and as you can see, is called The Return of History and has the great Simon Sharma writing for it. And, you know, it, it has uh, Deborah Lipstadt, it has our own uh, Robert Mann and Elliot Perlman. Um, so it'll be a universal magazine. That's my challenge. My challenge is to, to publish from Australia to the entire world, kind of by the world. And, and, and why did you decide to start with this uh, uh, theme of, of the return of history? And, and, are, all, and are all the um, subsequent issues under your uh, steerage going to be themed? Now, they'll all be themed. Uh, this, is, this, this is not what it was in the past, mm. uh, but I thought that theming worked very well as it does for us with Australian foreign affairs. Uh, it, it focuses the mind. Um, I look, the return of history, take a look at Eastern Europe, take a look at America. Uh, it's, it's a frightening thing and 
it really has to be written about again and again, I think. Um, and by the, by the best voices that we have, best thinkers that we have. So that was an obvious way to start. Um, but, but it won't always be political. It'll often be cultural. Um, it won't always be Jewish, basically. It might be. The next issue is about the new Middle East, which is the new geopolitics of the Middle East which is so hard to keep up with. Uh, Lena Khatib, who is uh, the head of Middle Eastern and Af North African studies at Chatham House, uh, will do the lead essay there. Uh, and this next edition will have uh, people like Deborah Levy and, uh, and, and, and others who are really major names. And that'll be a strong one. And then we go to the one after that, just to give you an idea of mm, the, yeah, please, the please. mood of that. Very exciting. Um, the one after that will be called The Strange Death of the Israeli Left. Uh, and that'll be a 10,000 word essay by, um, by Anshel Pfeffer, who is of course the great Haaretz uh, journalist. Uh, and that'll be a brilliant piece. And I think that the world will want to know. But I must add that in issue 245, which is the next issue, we have a 10,000 word essay by Nir Baram, you know, the, the great Israeli novelist and, and writer. And so we that just, is, uh, for, that is uh, most exciting. For Melbourne Jewish Book Week, uh, we, uh, we've got a, um, a series of six interviews with Israeli writers coming out soon as part of our book check series. And we've got Nir Baram. We've also got Benjamin Balink, who's in the current issue. So we're very excited with those links to literature. And, and writing and not just politics, although in Israeli literature, everything is politics, of course. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so, so, so there it is, we're excited and, and, and I'm looking forward to this, uh, to this talk between uh, Jonathan um, and... and... As much as everyone uh, would love to hear you and I talk on for, for much it, longer, I think we should go to the, uh, the main exactly course. Exactly, so, you know, and, and I really appreciate that Simon Sharma uh, wrote the very first main essay for us. Absolutely. Uh, very pleased with that. And, and, and it's a ripper and he's about to talk about it and, um, uh, and uh, I'm sure he'll refer a lot to what he wrote about. So look, thank you, Maury, very much for joining us. Um, all the very best with the publication. It's very exciting. Um, and and, uh, and you thank you for hosting the event. No problem. Thank uh, you, and, and, and Jewish sure Week, for doing that. No way. Thank you. I'm sure it won't be the, the first, uh, won't be the last one. And now, um, time for the main course. And for this, of course, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan Perlman, Jonathan Perlman, the editor of Jewish Quarterly. Over to you, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Nick. And um, so, Simon Sharma, it's wonderful to, uh, to have you here for this event. Um, hello. Hi, very happy to be here, but it, well, you know, Zoom shrinks planetary distance between here and Australia, but it makes me very Australia sick, if, I, if, the, if that's the way I want to put it, because I love Australia so much, and uh, yeah, I was there not so long ago, a couple of years ago, I think, in Melbourne, in fact, actually, yeah. Well, hopefully yeah. we can do, we can do the next one in, in person. Very tantalising. No, I want a planetary kangaroo jump, basically, or <laughs> <laughs> teleport me your way <laughs> we'll we'll do our best um we'll do our best well um um this is just a, a fantastic way also for us to be um uh having a relaunch of of jewish quarterly um and we'll be talking um for the next little while about about the pandemic um and about some of the, the forces that it's unleashed really globally. Um, uh, but, um, but I thought, you know, before we do, um, I'd just be interested to know the pandemic has, has played out so differently in so many different places. And that's, that's something that we'll, we'll touch on. Um, but how are things for you at the moment in New York? What are you, what does your life look like? I know you've had the jab. <laughs> Um, um, how are things for you over there? Thank you for asking. I'm, I'm double jabbed. I'm double Pfizer. Things oh. are opening up pretty quickly. And my wife, who's a scientist, indeed a geneticist, is slightly more cagey about it than me. I was in the city yesterday and, whoa, you know, people, people were masked. It was interesting. My son, who's an artist, 
visiting from the Bay Area in California was quite struck actually by how different the kind of mass culture is. We think of ourselves compared, let's say, to raw Texas or raw Florida, not that raw Texas and raw Florida uh, comprise the whole of the states. So it's quite obedient and collectively conscientious. But Gabriel, my son, was, was sort of, um, um, he was even he was surprised by how obedient people seem to be in the street in the open air about mask wearing, whereas well you know it's 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 turning into the summer of masks love in San Francisco, so they've kind of thrown thrown caution to the the Pacific wind I think really I think the thing is that we were so brutally struck at the beginning of the pandemic I mean I came back from Britain. Um, having been working on my last TV series, which is airing right now in Australia, mm. happy to say, sorry about the plug, um, about the romantics, and March the 11th, 2020, knowing we were, you know, this, this was going to be a big problem, but like I think many people, I had no idea about the scale, and we had our, you know, mortuary in the street moment, really. I know Melbourne, you know, thinking about kind of collective behaviour, Melbourne, was totally locked down, wasn't it? I, we have lots of wonderful Australian friends, some extremely close friends, and um, they one of the they live in Adelaide. And um, but but um, one of my friends, Claire Roberts, has family in Melbourne, including aged mother, I think. And the notion you couldn't travel between provinces, you know, between states, was was amazing, actually. So I, I again, cliche, first cliche of the hour, Jonathan. I, I never think of Australians as that, you know, um, obediently rule bound, actually, even when you're saving your skin, you know. So it was very impressive. Now yeah. we're all breathing a sigh of relief. The theatres are going to open, the sports stadia are going to open. And, um, you know, there are kind of gremlins lurking out there. And, and the funny thing is, I think actually having lunch outdoors with a friend of mine um, yesterday, um, I, you know, this is going to sound um, sanctimoniously virtue signaling, but the scenes from India are so horrific and so uh, upset, distressing, really. Um, I couldn't, I still can't quite get that out of, uh, mind. I mean, I'm sure they've been the equivalent in apparently in Latin America and Brazil, but a, a, a sort of, you know, one of the BRIC, B-R-I-C, you know, one of the up and coming developing cultures that is always thought to be part of the kind of modern economic world, completely flawed, disintegrating, no oxygen. The notion that India has to have oxygen flown in from Southeast Asia is really shocking. And this is something I know we'll talk about, the sort of sense in which this is a kind of world responsibility, you know, whether for collective self-interest or because of fundamental, humane, decent altruism, you know, it should be top of everybody's agenda right now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Australian, um, Compliance, um, which you which you refer to, is something I think we've uh, we've discovered about ourselves here. But it's uh, uh, it's worked to our favour in Australia, I think. Mm -hmm. um, um, I I would like to start um, with the Pfizer vaccine, which you've you've had right. had your double dose of. Um, you know, I think um, um, we we're so happy to be relaunching Jewish Quarterly, and we're so happy that your piece. Is 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 the lead piece for this issue, and the lead to your lead piece is about the Pfizer vaccine, um, and it, um, you know, you you present it um, as a phenomenon really that is quite emblematic of some of the broader social and political forces that we're seeing unfolding at the moment. Um, and I just wonder if we could start there, if you could tell us yeah. the story about the Pfizer vaccine and why you think it's so significant. Yeah, well, I was extremely struck by the fact that, you know, I began by actually thinking about who Albert Burla, the CEO, was. And um, and he, it, all I really knew, actually, was he was a Salonika Jew. In fact, uh, he's, he's often says, and I, I think he may even have described himself as a Safadi Salonika Jew, but it's actually, um, having talked to many of my friends who know Salonika very deeply, um, his family actually, there are all sorts of backstories 
Um, and there can maybe Ashkenazi elements in his family. He may be actually um, a Romaniot Jew. Those, that's what the, the Greek, the ancient Byzantine period, Greek Jewish community. But that was sort of interesting to me that actually his um, his immediate colleagues were, um, were were Turks living in Germany. So if you put together um, a Salonika Jew living in America, CEO of a kind of mighty corporation, um, and then working with two, you know, models of successful immigration, um, his, his, his scientists um, in Germany, you, you had a kind of picture which defied um, all the most pessimistic narratives about the unassimilability, uh, particularly of Muslim immigrants or people of Muslim origin at least. And also, of course, there was the added bit of spice that it was a Greek really working with two Turks. And um, Bula and, uh, uh, you know, and, and the two Turkish scientists are, are very understandably, and um, uh, it's rather kind of movingly anxious not to sell that particular side of the story, but they don't deny it either, actually. So I wanted to start with that. And then, then I did a little bit more digging, actually, about, um, about Albert Bula himself, who notoriously won't give interviews. So, you know, I wasn't surprised I couldn't actually reach him, although I really, I really hope I will in the future, because this story is, 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 in a way, part of a, a larger book I'm writing. Um, but he, in fact, went to university at Aristotle University, um, which was um, basically a very large part of which, including the labs I think he worked in as a, as a student, he, he was a vet student, were built on the remains of Salonika's Jewish cemetery, which started to be eaten away. I, I mean, the cemetery goes back as the community did, you know, many hundreds of years, at least 500 years, and um, which started to be eaten away um, in order to uh, and, and be regarded as redundant. Um, before the Second World War, um, the, the uh, ruin, total destruction and demolition of the cemetery did indeed happen at the hands of the Nazis, but the precedents before it um, started to take place in the 1920s and in earnest in the 1930s. Um, what happened during the war was particularly horrific in that gravestones, you can see them over Salonika, were used to kind of for repair churches, create a women, in one case, latrines, and really, really uh, appalling things happened. And then the next stage, so, you know, in the way of a lot of historical research is kind of serendipitous association, sort of get linked like some crazed computer link. You know, then I discovered that an anti-Semitic paper in Athens, it's not one that commands a very large reading public, but, you know, 8% is not nothing, particularly if you think about the neo-Nazi history of Golden Dawn, now rightly, categorized as a criminal organization. It turns out that, you know, when uh, the world was kind of celebrating Bula and, and uh, the majority of Greek opinion was treating him as a hero, an anti-Semitic newspaper um, suddenly pulled a switch which took us back to the blood libel of the Middle Ages, said this man is the Jew Bula is injecting poison into the veins of Greek Christians. And this is, you know, Mashoka completely insane, but we're dealing, you and I, you know, know very well, we're dealing with a world in which what, you know, Tuesday's insanity doesn't exactly become Thursday's mainstream, but it starts to kind of contaminate what we think of as should be an absolute barrier between absolutely outrageous discourse and something which is, you know, used in this case to suggest that He's, you know, he's not really Greek. He's certainly not Christian. He's some figure from the kind of godless cosmopolitan out there world um, who is intent on doing harm. And the point at which that becomes part of a more normalized discourse, of course, it absolutely feeds anti-vaccine rhetoric. So, so at the point at which it, it feeds the libertarian language of anti-vaccination campaigns, we've got a kind of devilish wiring together of ancient anti-Semitism and modern sort of libertarianism. Sometimes I was going to say evangelical libertarianism. This is profoundly, almost exponentially, rather than arithmetically sinister, I thought. But maybe I'm touchy. <laughs> hey, Jews, <laughs> we're famous for that. <laughs> 
I mean, what what is it um, about the pandemic? Is there something about the pandemic that is fueling this? And and it is um, how how much do we have to distinguish this by nation because it is playing out differently in a place like Greece. Um, this sort of, uh, as you put it, you know, this populist paranoia and revelation-based religious conviction that we're seeing um, playing out during the pandemic. But it is, it's playing out differently in different countries. So I just wonder to what extent, um, um, you know, why is the pandemic fueling this? And is this something, is this a sort of universal phenomenon or do we need to distinguish it by, by nation and culture? Oh, I think, I think the latter for sure, really. Um, I, I mean, um, you know, again, India on my mind, um, uh, it's what, whatever Narendra Modi has done wrong, which is a lot, really, um, I prepare the pandemic. I mean, it's a terrible, brutal, murderous paradox that India is simultaneously the world's largest manufacturer of vaccines mm. and has the most catastrophic shortage for its own people. Well, I think I, I want to back up just a little bit to say that, you know, they're, they're, we're in a very kind of psychologically paradoxical situation in that um, it, it's perfectly sensible and rational, actually, to be in some respects defensive in suddenly, you know, quarantine works, really. Um, uh, quarantine was invented, you know, to cope with the Black Death, and it, it was the only thing possible, really, no cure and no understanding what pathogenesis was. So in some sense, the defensive reaction, st ground the planes, put up barriers, is, is perfectly good kind of, you know, clinical prophylaxis really or social prophylaxis so so that on the other hand the other narrative sort of goes the opposite way that you also want there to be a kind of um you know uh, i was going to say olympian with i suppose greece on my mind but a kind of global sense of actually what the world will need because as um Cabreasus, you know the head the ethiopian which is itself very interesting head of the dub of the world health organization says quite rightly as a matter of a truism that until everyone's safe um no one's completely safe and um you know the short-term differences really and successes um as a result of actually putting up barriers to travel will absolutely work and in the long run really it's not just a matter of 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 people slipping under whatever barriers and quarantines we put up. It's also the case that actually, if there is unequal protection and vaccination over the world, this is a um, uh, this is an absolutely prime opportunity for a virus to, to carry on mutating and morphing into things which will escape. You're constantly trying to play catch up. So if these two kind of narratives for that, you do need an absolutely empowered global, I mean, not government, but you do need, the WHO in particular, I think, and it's doing, I should say, of course, through COVAX, you know, which was uh, a, an ag agreed system into which 172 countries bought, but they include countries like the United Kingdom, don't know about Australia, but I think Australia is mm -hmm. one, the United States most certainly, um, who bought like four or five times the number of vaccines for every single human being in their country. Again, there was a kind of you know, prudential logic to that in, in that it wasn't clear when the advance purchases were made, which ones would work. So, hey, we could afford it. Let's buy everything in the supermarket of vaccines. So you have, you have these sort of two narratives, one understandably defensive and one demanding a kind of transnational, pan-national you know, a global approach. But I think what, what we're also talking about is, um, is into all that, um, you now have, a, you know, many years or a decade of pumped up populist, um, you, you use the word paranoia, I think that's actually properly the correct word. I think of my great predecessor at Columbia University, Richard Hofstadter's work on the paranoid strain in American politics. America, not only, but if you think about kind of um, Sweden, for example, where I have good friends, Sweden's determination to do something absolutely not just different, but the absolute 
opposite of what Denmark, Norway and Finland were doing was absolutely fueled by a sense. Everybody thinks of us as the pussycats of, you know, the welfare statism. We're not. We're, we're our own kind of Scandinavians. And there was a tremendous colouring of nationalist rhetoric in that Swedish decision not to buy into masks and social distancing and mm. we know what we're doing and paying and still paying an absolutely egregiously catastrophic price for that. Yeah. Um, equally, and I'm, 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 I'm so sorry, I've gone on much too long, but equally, um, when you were talking about, you know, the kind of abrasive, weird, abrasive interface between science and cultures who, for whom authority has to be done through various kinds of religious revelation, you know, the heartland, it is no accident, obviously everybody will have seen that, um, the, the states in the United States that have had the most trouble with take up of vaccinations um, have been exactly the, the, the states where evangelical Christianity, um, you know, is, is strongest in uh, particularly in, in the southeast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like to talk to you in, in, in a little while about that, about that. Um... Kind of battle which which you discuss in your piece between between knowledge and and uh, and, and religion, um, uh, um, but uh, but before we do, um, I, I do want to come back. I mean, you you, you referred to the sort of anti-Semitic tribes that have emerged in Greece, but they've they've emerged um, even you know even in places like the US, as you look at in your in your piece, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, and. You know, you have quite quite an inter interesting um, insights, which I hope you can share um, about about why this is happening and why this happens when you have this sort of um, unleashing of paranoia um, and and populism. Why are they picking up on um, why do anti-Semitism anti-Semitic tropes feed into that and and um, and if you could talk about the strange kind of contradictions um, that you look at in your piece um, between the ways in which in which Jews are depicted, um, you know, as sort of rich and poor, um, uh, um, so so the, the Jews tend to be kind of quite malleable within this uh, within this kind of uh, right. populist and prejudicial rhetoric. Mm. I think that there there are two elements to that. Um, one is that. Um, when something happens out of left field, as we say in America, and just simply seems to undo everything you take for granted about a normal social and economic life, in a, in a, in a country like America, notwithstanding the fact that it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a political and set, uh, a, a society built on immigration, notwithstanding that, it's often thought to be the work of foreigners in some way. Um, you know, in, in our Jewish historical context, it's very easy to go back to, um, we sometimes forget, the kind of bitter response to huge migration of Ashkenazi Jews from Poland and Russia and Eastern Europe at the beginning of the 20th century, when Jews were very often, apart from being regarded as illiterate and possibly quasi-criminal, and uh, um, they were also regarded as vectors of disease, particularly of typhus. As well, these the, these were lousy people, literally lice ridden people. And I'm not saying, you know, that the same accusation wasn't leveled at Italians and the Irish and and so on. It was, but it was particularly brutal. Um, and it was there was a kind of paranoid strain um, of writers um, who worried about very much in the way in which so-called replacement rhetoric works out now. The end of the white race, one of the famous anti-immigrant books, which was a huge bestseller in, I think, about 1906, um, was essentially um, a cry of desperation that America was being flooded with these disease-ridden people who were not Christian, um, who, were, who were going to basically kill real America by the virtue of their arrival. And no matter how much they were disinfected on Ellis Island and other places, still there was some sort of sense 
of a kind of biological contamination. And we think of that kind of really disgusting rhetoric as purely Nazi, um, just as we think of you know, Nazi eugenics and so on, and the biological, horrible biological side of, of Nazi exterminationist literature. And indeed it was, but it, it always had a much longer and larger and broader catchment um, in the same sense that we, we think of, you know, the kind of paranoid conspiracy theory about Jews running the world, a secret cabal, as again, something that was particularly, you know, came and went and received its monstrous consummation in the fight in the shower and the final solution. But of course, you know, if you if you pick up a newspaper that was published on like Drummond's newspaper, Libre Parole at the time of the Dreyfus case, you'll find exactly the same. In in, in volume two of the Jews, sorry for the plug, belonging. Um, I was just absolutely horrified by, um, you know, by th 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 there was a moment in the Dreyfus case um, where one of the forgers, uh, Mangon Henri, um, was exposed as having actually forged ridiculously and clumsily a pseudo Dreyfus letter, which was supposed to be the nail in the, the coffin of Dreyfus's guilt. And it was exposed as a kind of clumsy forgery and he committed suicide in prison. And his widow uh, had to pay legal costs or something. And the publisher of the most vitriolic anti-Semitic newspaper, Drummond, then um, launched a kind of contribution campaign to sort of pay the legal expenses and the living expenses of the widow. And also he invited anybody who wanted to contribute to that anti-Semitic, anti draper self say what they would like to do with Jews. And it was very striking to me how many of them were kind of medically um, sort of obsessed. There was a lot of sense about Jewish doctors are actually corrupting and perverting for their insidious purposes in medical schools. So let's use Jews for live dissection, that sort of thing. I mean, really, really horrifying, hardcore Dr. Mengele and worst things were said in, you know, the, in 1899, actually. So mm -hmm. in some sense, all those things continue. And what is what I think, you know, those of us in, you know, um, over rationalized academia, let's put it like that, you know, Jewish, oh, Jewish courtly friends really find difficult to imagine is something like, you know, the perpetual replenishment of um, systematic mishigas. Let's 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 uh, let the Jewish quarterly be the first to sort of use the terminology. <laughs> so that the whole QAnon thing, really, of uh, uh, sex trafficking children, paedophile murder, shades into something which all of you Jewish quarterly readers will recognise as, you know, absolutely the perpetuation of the idea that Jews kidnap Christian children and and slit them open to drink their blood and, and bake matzah. So the notion that actually something as, which ought to be self-evidently insane, having a, an online internet presence, in fact, not just an online internet presence, but a presence that actually can multiply because of the echo chamber nature and because of the unaccountability of of you know systematic mishigas, <laughs> the SM syndrome, um, it's, ju it's just really, really very hard to take. And I think it gives us a sort of sense, not of helplessness, but of, um, you know, uh, deep anxiety. And um, the necessity, of course, is actually to fight back. So I'll just say one thing more about specifically about the pandemic. So of course, the Soros issue is immense. And into the Soros issue, the Soros is the kind of diabolical force who will do things. Soros in cahoots with Bill Gates to put five, to make 5G a, a kind of the instrument of the enslavement of the, of the Christian world. Um, that sort of thing, really, um, having millions of credulous believers across the world uh, ought to be unconscionable, but it's now absolutely rip roaring. I actually, in um, Ron Rosenbaum, Commission some of us. I'm sorry, I'm looking away. I'm looking to see if I can find the book. And I can't. Um, uh, God, it must have been 15 years ago. Um, a book of essays about really the perpetual vigor of anti Semitism. And I stupidly, I'll tell you why stupidly, volunteered to do the online chapter. I mean, it was my idea. Um, 
And I had no idea. It was one of the worst months of my life doing the research. You could click on, you know, the word storm, for example, and you would have an absolutely full-on defense of the, of the final solution. Um, and with all its comic book icons, you know, that was the thing, that they love comic book, Pepe the front and all the rest of it, kind of comic book. So QAnon, they work by insignia and signs and emblems that's out, it's not, it's not rarefied, you know, it's not like moldering copies of the physical copies of the protocols of the elders of Zion. It's hot and pulled from the web and it has its own vernacular, it has its own successful vernacular. All those things in a pandemic, they are out secretly, the cabal, to kill us with this fake vaccine, this poisoned vaccine, it's just taken wing. I mean, not that we should necessarily expect um, these sort of um, conspiracy theorists to be kind of um, consistent or rational or, um, or or sort of have any kind of logical soundness. But how do they um, how do they make these two versions of you know, if we're talking about the um, um, anti anti Semites? I mean, how how do they how do these two versions of the Jews coexist in which you have um, George Soros and this this idea of Jews controlling the world, um, with also Jews being kind of you know vermin scum. I mean, how do those yeah. two coexist? Oh, I think again, not not to be boringly history professor. That that was already figured out again in nineteenth century anti-Semitic rhetoric. That's say how the Rothschilds and Rothschilds have made an. By the way, you must have noticed, Jonathan, an enormous comeback actually in the parlance of anti-Semitism. Extraordinary. Um, but you had the sort of sense of kind of king Jews, the Jews of gold, um, and um, a, a horde, an army of um, subhumans, you know, who are their kind of slave army, who are kind of walking, you know, bipedal viruses themselves, actually. So in, as you said, you don't expect it to be kind of under any real norms, logical, but as a kind of, you know, Grimm Brothers fairy tale, that, that's tough on the Brothers Grimm, um, but as a kind of fantasy, if you think of it in terms of what you would see in Lord of the Rings or, um, or, or something even more, or you know, Game of Thrones or something. Um, an arcane wizard come king with unlimited access to gold, and an army of orcs or something, mud people. Is uh, it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a gripping narrative. You know, it works. It works as it were cinematically. Um. <laughs> Um, that's a good. That, that's a good uh, um, a model. Um, uh, and and this 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 warning, which you just just mentioned, that we we do need to take QAnon seriously, and that it's but it's it is sometimes hard to take these sorts of mm. um, these sorts of theories, which sound like lunacy. Yes, I have to interrupt you for a second. I'm looking behind your handsome face at the letter Q. <laughs> Watch out! And it's all just there. Like, everybody <laughs> see, and it's just a little J. It's like the Q bit. Yes, it's tiny. And the Q bit, you have to rethink your logo, dear friend. We're, we're, that, you've uh, just we're sprung. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, boys. Uh, whoa! <laughs> You're gonna get readers that really don't want. Yeah. Um. Uh. But um. Um. Is this, um, you know, is this, is has this, you've, you know, you've been in America now for for for, for quite a while. Um, my life. Yeah. yeah, I mean, is this something that's surprised you to see us having to take these theories seriously, um, or is this something that we uh, we've uh, always needed to do? No, I mean, I've always been interested in it because I think even though, you know, it was quite late in my, I, I wrote, my second book was a piece of Jewish history about um, the Rothschilds and the Yeshua before, you know, uh, really before most of it, before First World War. So it was a bit of Jewish history there. And I, I ran a Jewish history seminar, my first job at Cambridge. Um, but I, I was sort of historian 
um, who wanted to do the history of cultures that weren't mine. I mean, there are two different kinds of historians, those who constantly are investigating the sense of their own identity. And in fact, you know, this is not um, quite on our subject, but it's not unimportant. Um, you know, history actually used in order for kind of identity reaffirmation. That was never my thing. I was much more of a wandering Jew. I deliberately wanted to do Dutch history and, and French history in particular, because I always felt history, I was, I was in the Herodotus rather than the Thucydides camp and Jewish quarterly readers will know what I mean. So I was always a bit of a kind of gossipy wanderer and wanted to be out there. So when I came back to Jewish history, um, you know, I, I, I knew about the long life. You couldn't know the long life, but I, we did, my generation did think that, you know, the, the only, not, not a, no silver lining in the Shoah, but the, the Shoah had kind of put paid for the most part. It marginalized to the, to the point of utter insignificance. What we're now seeing is not insignificant at all. So that shift really, not just in America, but in other places. I mean, I was, again, you know, the Anti-Defamation League, I think B'nai B'rith did a survey of attitudes to Jews through Europe, and in which again, Greece rather upsettingly, you know, came out tops for people who believe that Jews had too much control of the media, um, uh, Jews have too much money. The usual, not that, you know, new Auschwitz should be created, but, but all the, kind of ancient tropes were whoa absolutely still very very much alive um and you know the rise of le pen pair you know an absolute full-on holocaust denialist really in terms of french mm. history all those things should have kind of pointed us to the you know and the, the way in which really anti-zionist and anti-israel rhetoric then morphed into i mean that essentially also gave new life to some of these ancient and, and horrifying libels. In, in America's case, what changed things in particular um, was Barack Obama. You know, I think, you know, uh, the re-election of Barack Obama, again, made us very complacent. Those of us who, you know, who admired him enormously and were overjoyed to sort of see an African-American, mixed race African-American, um, in the White House completely failed to notice actually until Donald Trump came along actually how bitterly and viscerally a very large part of American culture thought this was the end of America. I thought it was an unnatural thing um, for somebody uh, you know who's an African-American to be in as it were the White House you know black to be in the White House um, so what we took as a sign of American maturity and an end of paranoia was actually the beginning of a, a new phase by which it was rejuvenated. And that 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 has been a really bitter education for us, I believe. Yeah. And and that um, you know, that 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 divide and um um between uh maybe the 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 that that switch between the Obama and Trump years, I suppose, parallels a little bit. Um the divide that we're seeing um, between, um, you know, in America in particular, but between what you describe um, in, in your piece as communities of belief and communities of knowledge, um, a split that we've seen during during the pandemic, um, and that we're seeing, you know, with all these um, anti-vaxxers uh, and um, and resistance to to lockdowns. Um, I mean, I don't want this to turn into one of those sort of Richard Dawkins style uh, uh, debates, but I'm I'm interested. I mean, you seem to um, to 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 fall on the side of the um, communities of knowledge, and I I'm just wondering, um, you know, in terms of how a state should function. I mean, how um, how should a secular a secular state committed to to, to knowledge, to science, to, you know, expertise, um, accommodate communities of belief, um, which, yeah, which, it's, may, it's which very may not. Yeah, it's an incredibly important question. And I'm not actually, I'm, I, I admire Richard a little bit, but I, I'm actually not a talking site in the sense in which the two cannot under any circumstances 
cohabit the same the same world of you know mentality i don't believe that at all and that's why our friend mimologies you know occurs towards the end mm. of the piece he was someone whose whole life was dedicated to um, disabusing people of the fantastic like astrology making a huge distinction between astrology and astronomy um in seeing what was then the kind of vector of Greek scientific learning filtered through Arabic learning, not only as not um, an enemy of Judaism, but a fundamental support of it, um, or, you know, a kind of life giver in a way um, into the, so, so the, I'm, you know, whatever the wobbliness of my beliefs, I'm a shul goer from time to time. Um, I'm absolutely, I suppose I class myself as agnostic rather than atheist. A lot of you out there who are braver atheists will say, well, he, you know, he would say that, the, the cowardly intellectual worm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that, that's my position. And so I think actually the, 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 the really important question, the really important um issue you raised, Jonathan, is, is that it's incumbent really not to be like Dawkins in some way, and that's to say, um, to, to work through um, ministers and rabbis and um, those at any rate are prepared to accept, which, you know, pikuach nefesh, the principle of uh, um, essentially of halacha being abandoned when it's absolutely, or overridden, when it's necessary to save life, that goes back not just to the Talmud, but to the Mishnah, and perhaps before that as well. So it's this very, very deep strain in both Judaism and Christianity, indeed in Islam as well, um, in all the great religions, actually, of, um, you know, being broad enough to, um, to embrace science rather than to reject it as, uh, as, as a threat. Um, and it's very interesting, I've been working on, I hope this isn't too much of a digression, even by my standards. Um, I've been working on the 19th century response to cholera, um, particularly in the Islamic world, actually, and the role that, in, there were some Jewish doctors, but they're, you know, the, the most important figures there were not necessarily Jewish. One of them was Marcel Proust's father, who marries a Jew, of course. Um, and they go out to Iran, Persia, and to Egypt and to Turkey and um, establish modern medical educational um, uh, institutions. And the issue, of course, they have to face is the Hajj, the annual pilgrimage, um, which is uh, a terrifying concentration of rapturous belief, which was extremely likely to pass on cholera from one community to another. They're also working, weirdly enough, with um, a resistance in the West to the notion that cholera was contagious, actually, rather than simply being something arose in discrete, separated communities. So there, what's really interesting is there, there um, is that the imams, um, rather like kind of Hasidic, you know, hardcore Hasidic rabbis, were absolutely trapped. First of all, in the notion is that God's judgment, it will decide whether people die en masse of a terrible disease or not as a punishment for transgression. But secondly, also in, weirdly enough, you know, medieval, um, uh, not exactly pathogenesis, but medieval notion of actually how the body performs, which my monology shared, namely Galen's notion, the rule con constituted from four humors, and it's a disequilibrium disequilibrium between our phlegm and our color, our phlegm and our bile and our sanguine, which makes us vulnerable to. So what you had to do really, and they're very conscious of this, is to recruit uh, people from the religious community who were prepared to accept that that wasn't adequate any longer to prevent the death of very large numbers of people. And they did very much their best to try and do that. And actually the rulers of, they, they weren't necessarily um, uh, you know, there in, in their mind cast permanently, but the rulers both of, uh, in all those three countries I mentioned, in 19th century Qajar, Iran, in Ottoman Turkey, and in the Kedavite of Egypt were absolutely, you know, part of this mobilization. Turkey was, um, am I going to get this right? I believe it is. Is Turkey is the first country in the world to actually impose mandatory vaccination against smallpox 
against smallpox. And they did it partly because this is interesting too. And again, since they do forgive the digression, um, partly because actually variolation, the idea that you use pus from a smallpox victim and you scratch your arm, this was replaced eventually by Edward Jenner and cowpox, had actually been invented in Turkey, had been invented in the world of Islamic medicine. So in some sense there was, you know, uh, but the, I guess the general point I'm making in answer to your excellent question is that uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't be a zero sum game. You know, for example, and it, it, sorry, one one tiny more thing. Um, in the American South, a lot of the reluctance about vaccination take up has quite understandably been because of what happened to the so-called Tuskegee experiment where um, health authorities used blacks uh, in awful experiments about syphilis without actually telling them, black servicemen, it was a really terrible thing. And that's remained a kind of hideous nightmare for black communities in the South. So black ministers um, have, have uh, been heroic really in, in volunteering their persuasive um, ability in church really to persuade people to, to get vaccinated. Um, uh, I, I might just, just um, I mean, I, I'm interested in, in, in Maimonides. Um, I don't want to, uh, to give away the ending of, the, of this piece to those who haven't read it, but, um, but I will say that he, he sort of Enter, enters the piece as the sort of climax or hero um, of this piece, or um, 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 you know, that's that's at least how I I read it because he, um, you know, for you manages to to accommodate um, both you know a commitment to to knowledge and a and to science and a commitment to to belief and to exploring both, and I'm just wondering personally for you. Um, uh, you know, is is Maimonides a figure who 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 you've always thought about in that way? Is he is he been an important figure for you? And and are there other figures, um, other historical figures who you who you who you would sort of class him with? Yeah, he has, and um, I think it was a huge thing, really. Um, and of course, one has to remember that you know he was very controversial, not just during his lifetime, but after he died. He was excommunicated, not by all, you know, but by a number of rabbis in Provence and um, and southwest France, and it ended up with the, um, you know, guide to perplex being burnt in in public uh, as an offensive. But that's not, I mean, that's not why he's a hero of mine. The the heroic um, factor really relies, if you think particularly about how in the whole reinvention of what Hanukkah was, that's to say Hellenistic culture, Hellenism is absolutely the enemy of what might be called the Isaiah version of Judaism, which is so absolutely emphatic in its hatred of paganism, of idolatrous paganism, that Judaism is almost defined by its complete rejection of anything that could conceivably be thought of as, as Greek as classical, uh, or, and indeed later as Roman. This is of course belied massively by archeology span in Eretz Israel itself. You know, all those tombs in the Valley of Kidron are absolute classic cross between kind of Parthian tombs and Hellenistic tombs. But so for Maimonides to say, actually, not only is it okay to use Aristotelian logic, um, but actually it's essential and it's actually, in fact, whether they knew it or not, it's actually part of, in a way of Talmudic self-examination was well, just an enormous step. And either you think that's the beginning of the end of true Judaism, or you think it's the beginning of a whole revitalization of Judaism. And you know, that, that story of, um, you know, how far can you go in the direction of understanding epistemology, in other words, the sources of authority for what knowledge is, on the one hand, will expand explosively in Spinoza, who is also a kind of hero of mine, but Spinoza is a kind of, I mean, what, what's touching is the, uh, the successive attempts beyond Spinoza to try and make him into a good Jew, the most moving of which 
is Moses Mendelssohn's, you know, love affair really with Spinoza, but doomed and futile really, because either you acknowledge the fact that the Bible is written by many different hands over many different centuries, and God does not march historically from era to era telling you what to do, but is a kind of, you know, um, a, a kind of Judaized deism. He's he's the creative force, but then he says you're on your own, you're, you're free will, you know, have a nice life or not. Um, that's, that's a huge distinction. But that kind of, you know, Promethean relationship with really bringing the two forms of knowledge into communion with each other. Yeah, that's that's very important. Um, for me, we I will. Think. We're going to have to. We're going to have to end fairly soon. So this this okay. may need to be the last question. And um, um, and so um, I don't want to tell you how to answer it, but don't don't end on too gloomy a note for us. Oh um, no, I, I'm cheer, I'm cheerful by nature, John. <laughs> Um, because, uh, um, uh, you know, one of the things you talk about in your piece is, um, you know, you focus a lot on, on, on how this has played out in America, but you also look at Israel where, um, where, you know, it's going through its own debate between, um, yes. religious and secular communities, um, and trying to figure out how to be, um, or if it can be a sort of, you know, Jewish and democratic state and how those, um, how those different aspects of its identity work together, and I just wonder, um, uh, you know, when, when you when you, how do you think that debate is going to unfold? Can can these questions be be resolved? Can Israel resolve those those two sides to its identity? It's a tough one, but I but the the optimism in me isn't just sentimental. I think the crucial point, it's almost the overwhelmingly important point. I think, especially, um, forgive the presumption, dear Jewish quarterly readers, um, I, but very often the Haredi community is thought of as much too in much too monolithic a way um, that they're all people who don't actually you know, recognize the state of Israel's authority for anything that are prepared to wear. I talk about this a bit, you know, in uh, put a yellow star and actually uh, in response to lockdown enforcement, um, as if it's equivalent to being herded onto the cattle trains. That's a mistaken view of the, of the, uh, the ultra, even the ultra Orthodox community, quite apart from the division between so-called modern Orthodox and Haredim. Within Haredi society itself, there was a very vigorous and lively um, debate actually about the status of so-called modern learning, about um, learning which isn't simply um, Tamil Torah learning and yeshiva learning and, and how important it is. Also about whether or not, you know, there are arguments for having Haredis want to serve in the IDF actually, but you know, not least to try and convert the heathen, you know, to have a kind of presence there. So I think there are, every time you have those kinds of openings, and this isn't just wishful thinking, this is a fact of modern Israeli life, um, then you have the possibility of exactly the kind of dialogue which will avoid really this terrible, you know, mutually, uh, this kind of cultural camp of mutual hatred, which isn't to say that things can't get extremely raw. But then one thing about Israeli politics and history also, this should be a good ending perhaps for us, Jonathan, is that, you know, it always produces impossible and almost comical surprises. The idea of Naftali Bennett really having to form a government with the senior Arab, <laughs> Arab Israeli politician is just wonderful. <laughs> You know, really, it's a wonderful surprise. You know, I mean, you know, bring out the chuppah. Um, <laughs> this is the best shidduch for Israeli politics you could possibly imagine. That's great. Yes, and then he he, he has sort of seven or so seats as well, and um and 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 you know could could potentially end up prime minister. Yeah. Um. To to add to the to the comedy or the farce or however you want to put it. Um, uh, so Simon, it's been fantastic to talk to you, um, and, um, and, uh, it's really great to have you in, in our, in our first issue of, well, I, Jonathan, um, I'll interrupt you for a second, just to say how thrilled I am that Jewish Quarterly, um, is 
up and running and has been taken back from the brink of oblivion. And thank you, Murray Schwartz, about whom I'm just learning. So, <laughs> oh, what a good Jew, what a man. <laughs> so if you're out there, Murray, <laughs> a psychosant, you know, you are a, you're a hero. <laughs> um, um, well, that's great to hear. Um, and uh, we are delighted to be, um, to be relaunching with you. Um, um, in this way, so thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. Pleasure. It's, a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful piece, and it's been great to kind of bring it to life a little bit here today. Um, and uh, and and thank you, um, thank you, Melbourne Jewish Book Week, and um, um, for for hosting us and organising the event. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, back to you, Nick. Thanks very much. Oh wow! Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Jonathan and Simon, for what was such an illuminating discussion. You, you covered so much ground. Um, I couldn't have imagined some of the links you made uh, unless I'd read the essay itself, which, of course, where, where, where much of the discussion stemmed from and those links were initially made. Um, so thank you guys so much. I could keep sitting here listening to you for hours and hours and hours, um, but life must go on. Um, of course, Simon's full essay, as I said, is in the Jewish Quarterly out now. Uh, subscribers to the Melbourne Jewish Book Week newsletter will already have been made aware of it, obviously. And if you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, I urge you to do so uh, to keep informed of what we've got going on. Um, and uh, with that in mind, next month, uh, Tuesday, the 8th of June, we have our gala online event featuring eight Australian and international guests performing commissioned original pieces on the theme, Fake It Till You Make It. It's an extravaganza not to be missed. Um, on Tuesday, the 13th of July, uh, we have uh, Sarah Kresnerstein, um, author of The Believer, her latest book, of course, The Trauma Cleaner before that. She'll be talking to uh, Mer uh, Meredith Lake. Um, uh, and that gives you two months to read The Believer if you haven't already, in case you want to ask her some questions specifically about, about that book. Um, Finally, as always, if you have enjoyed this evening, and I have no doubt you have enjoyed it immensely, you couldn't could not have, I urge you to make a donation to Melbourne Jewish Book Week. Um, you can see how we've been working very hard to bring you all manner of events, uh, particularly over the last 12 months online, uh, and almost all of them, or up to date, all of them for free. So please support us. Um, it really will help, it will help us keep giving you uh, these absolute top quality uh, speakers and events. Uh, details, details of how to donate will follow. Um, that's all for what has been an amazing uh, discussion and evening and, and Melbourne Jewish Book Week event. Uh, good evening, and I look forward to seeing you all next, Tuesday, next uh, month, Tuesday, 8th of June, for our Fake It Till You Make It event. Good night.